Brad and good evening everyone. Certainly is exciting times that we live in as Fred was alluding to and we're going to spend a little bit of time at the end of our presentation just to consider what is going on in the world at the moment. And um, we'd like to begin though by just uh, touching on the purpose of Bible prophecy which is to help us understand the end from the beginning. If you just come in your Bibles to the 25th chapter of Proverbs, we read there that God has hidden away things in his book of truth, that it is for those who want to be kings and priests of the future age to search into and to find out. So we read in Proverbs chapter 25 in the second verse, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. And that's really what we have to do when it comes to prophecy, is to take the things that are written before time, uh, that have been written for our learning, upon whom the end of the world is come, and we have to take those and we have to search them out. When we come to the book of Revelation in chapter 1, it's a prophecy. And it's a prophecy about the time of the end. And uh, we read there that it's the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent it and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Now it's not the only prophecy in the Bible, but this one kind of gives us a clue as to how to understand the prophetic word. And that is, is that we have to search these things out. They are sent to show us, his servants, things which must shortly come to pass, but they are signified. And the word there means to express by sign, or by symbol. So that being the case, when it comes to prophecy, there are symbols that are given to us that we have to look into and try and figure out what they mean. And it's by the sorting out of the symbols, so to speak, that we can see the path that God has intended for us to see in what he's going to do in the world around us. We read in the, the third verse of Revelation chapter 1 that blessed is he that readeth, those who hear the words of this prophecy and who keep those things that are written therein for the time is at hand. So the prophetic word is not just about understanding um, what God is going to do, but it begs of us a response. We have to read it. We have to figure out what is in there. We have to listen to those things to hear them. And then we have to keep the things that are written because the time is at hand. Now, John's beginning that prophecy in around the year A.D. 96, and it's been unfolding ever since. But what we're approaching now is the end of time, really, the end of the times of the Gentiles uh, that are discussed by the Lord Jesus Christ when the kingdom of God is about to be established on the earth. So we'd like to come into the prophecy of Daniel, where we'll spend most of our time this evening. And it's Daniel chapter 2. Um, we'd like to begin with, and there are three prophecies in Daniel that have to do with the Greek Empire. Daniel chapter 2 is one of them, Daniel chapter 7 touches on it as well, and Daniel chapter 8. And actually there's, there's others in there, but those are the three that we're going to step through this evening. When Daniel chapter 2 was written, it was surrounding a king named Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of the Babylonians. And he had taken Israel captive, the children of Israel from Judah in the south and from the ten tribes of Israel in the north. They were taken by the Assyrians previously. And they were taken away to Babylon. And one of the young men that was taken with them to Babylon is a young man named Daniel. And Daniel is there in Babylon and the king has a dream. So King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and this dream is of this great image. And what the king sees is this nightmarish dream. And in this dream, he recognizes that there's something special about it. So he, he calls for all the magicians and soothsayers and astrologers of Babylon to come and to figure out, uh, explain to him what this dream is. But he kind of puts a, a catch to it because anybody could come up with, uh, you know, sort of a, a meaning to a dream. In fact, um, it's kind of like modern art. You know, what does it mean? Um, I remember when I was in grade 12 and I had to do a, a portfolio and one of the things they wanted was what's called a Jackson Pollock, which is just paint splattered all over the place, which wasn't really my thing, but I could throw paint on the floor as good as anybody else could, so I did. And uh, then the teacher asked me to explain what it meant. 
And um, so I just made up a whole bunch of rubbish and explained to her what it meant. And she was completely fascinated by this. Good thing she never asked me the next day what I had explained the day before because I couldn't remember it. Um, because I just made it up. And that's where the king in, in Daniel chapter 2, he sort of figures, well, anybody could do that. So he kind of comes up with a little fail safe. He says, I'll tell you what, I want you to tell me what the dream is and then tell me what the meaning is. And of course, the magicians and the soothsayers and everybody else says, well, that's impossible. So he's testing the validity of what their actual ability is. But along comes Daniel, and Daniel tells the king in verse 28, as is on the screen there, he says, there is a God in heaven which reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. And he tells him about your dream of your head upon your bed is this, and explains it to him about this great image. And then he says, um, there is a God in heaven. He says, he that revealeth secrets makes known to thee what will come to pass. And he goes on to describe this great picture in Daniel, and, um, or in Daniel chapter 2, this dream that the king had. So what it was, was of a great image that was made up of multiple metals, and um, each of those metals had its different phases to it. So um, we've actually, in, in a couple of classes here, looked at the first two of them. The first was Babylon, and the second was Medo-Persia. The one we're going to spend our time on tonight is Greece. But if you just look at Daniel chapter 2, um, take a look at the verse 36. He says, this is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, and the beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven, has he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So that's the beginning point of Daniel chapter 2. He tells the king, Nebuchadnezzar, you are represented in this image by the head of gold. So that is Babylon. And he says in verse 39, after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and then another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over the earth. So the inferior kingdom was the kingdom of, represented by the silver chest and arms. And of course, what followed the Babylonians was the Medes and the Persians. And the story of that comes up in Daniel chapter 5, where it's Belshazzar's feast. And we read there at the end of the feast, um, in verse 29, when the, uh, the writing came on the wall, he says to him, verse 28, your kingdom is divided, it's given to the Medes and the Persians. And that night, King Belshazzar dies, and he's Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. And it says in verse 30, and that night was King Belshazzar, the, the king um, of the Chaldeans slain, so he's the Babylonian king, the Chaldeans, and Darius the Mede took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old, or 62 years old. So the Medes and the Persians came next, and then following them would be a third kingdom, which is the subject for tonight, which was the kingdom of the Greeks. So in verse 39, it describes another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And so knowing world history, um, all you have to do is look at what are the major empires uh, that went in succession after the Babylonians were the Medes and the Persians. After the Medes and the Persians were the Greeks. And they, of course, were followed by the Romans. So the Bible, though, explains all this ahead of time. God is revealing to us what has taken place before it actually happened. And so this is hundreds of years before these things would take place. In fact, it's about 300 years before um, the Greek Empire would arise when Daniel is explaining this prophecy to the king, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, if you just come over in your Bible to chapter 7 of Daniel, we have another vision in Daniel chapter 7. And what it is, is the same story just told in a slightly different way. Daniel 2 is man's view of the kingdom of men. It's bright, it's shiny, it's made of gold and silver and brass and iron, and it's nice and, and polished, and uh, that's the way men look at themselves. We're pretty good. Um, God doesn't exactly see them that way. So when Daniel has his dream in chapter 7, this is a night vision. It's a terrifying dream. And he says there, it's the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, that Daniel has this dream and a vision of his head upon his bed. 
And he writes the dream down and, and tells the sum of the matters. He says, I saw in my vision by night, verse 2 of chapter 7, behold, four winds um, of, the, of the heaven strove on the great sea. So he sees this great storm that's taking place on this great sea. And he says in verse 3, four beasts came up from the sea, different one from another. So he tells us then that there is this four peculiar beasts. One is a, a lion with wings, and we don't see many of those around these days. Another one is a, is a bear raised on one side with three ribs in its mouth. Then there is a leopard that has wings and uh, four heads and a dragon finally, or a, a, a fourth beast he calls it, um, which has ten horns. And as you read through this, and, and all the description is given, the one we're going to be focusing on tonight is that of the, the leopard with the four wings and the four heads. Heads. But he tells you in verse 16, I came near to one of them that stood by, so one of the angels that Daniel is seeing in this vision, and he asks him, what does all this mean? And so he says, um, the great beasts, which are four, are four kings which are going to arise out of the earth. So these are four kings or four kingdoms that would come along. And they, they parallel what we saw in Daniel chapter 2. The first king or kingdom was the Babylonians, and that's the one depicted by the lion with the wings. Then we have the Medo-Persians, which are depicted by the, the bear. And then we have the Greeks, which are depicted by the, the leopard with the four heads and the four wings. And finally, the fourth beast, which is described as being dreadful and terrible, and it has iron teeth, which of course relate it to the iron legs of the image, and it is um, described basically as breaking in pieces. So that's the Roman Empire. But our focus this evening is on this fourth beast, which is described, he says, I beheld and lo, another like a leopard, which had on the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given unto it. So that's going to be the focus of our, our thoughts tonight, is this third beast, sorry, which has these four heads and these four wings. So that's the, the starting point where we're going to kind of jump in on this prophecy. Now when you look at this, you say, okay, that's peculiar. Um, you don't often see creatures running around with four heads. So when we're looking at this, we have to say, well, what does this mean? What is the idea of wings? Well, in, Bible, or in the Bible, wings are often used as a symbol of power. Um, sometimes it's a protective power, and sometimes it's a, a military power. In fact, in the book of Ruth, in chapter 2 and verse 12, uh, Ruth is told there that the Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. So in this case, he says, look, God has symbolically wings that he, he uses to protect people. And the Lord Jesus Christ picks up on this when he talks about Jerusalem. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, how often would I have gathered you together like a hen gathers its chicks under its wings and protects them? He says, but you wouldn't have it. So instead of the protection of God, what they actually got was the, the Roman armies that came down upon them who were described as being eagles gathered around a carcass. And it's described as well in Deuteronomy. A nation would come from far, in Deuteronomy 28, as swift as the eagles and flies. So this idea of wings is the idea of protection, but it's also the idea of these powers um, that can protect or they can attack. And it's described further when we get to this goat vision later on that we'll talk about in a moment. It also has, though, four heads, which is, again, fairly peculiar. And heads are usually used of something that, you know, leads the body. I mean, you can cut a lot of things off of your body, but if you remove the head, um, it pretty well finishes the whole story, doesn't it? Um, heads are something that give direction. In Ezekiel chapter 10, there are some fairly peculiar creatures called the cherubim. And it's described that these cherubim um, they go wherever the head was to look. So whether the head looks, they follow it, and they turn not whether they went. That makes sense to us. You take a horse out, and the idea is to point the head of the horse in the direction you want to go. 
and usually the horse will do that unless I'm riding it and then it will go in a different direction anyway. But that's what we do. We put bits in there, Marius, and you steer the head because wherever the head is pointing, that is the direction that the animal is going to go in. So when you have this idea of four heads, it's the idea of four leaders or four ones that are going to give the direction. And it's interesting that all of these different creatures have their power given to them by God. Um, if you look at Daniel chapter 4, just over a couple of pages, or back a couple of pages, um, in verse 7, the great king Nebuchadnezzar, which was represented by the lion, or the head of gold, um, at one point in time, he was humbled by God um, until he realized that it wasn't him that was responsible for the, the building of the great empire that he ruled over. And he says in verse 17, this matter is by the decree of the watchers, and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that it's the most high, which is God, who rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will and sets up over it the basest of men. So man might think he's got it all sort of sorted out, um, but it's God that rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. And he'll set over it whoever he chooses even if they are the basis of men. So that is a common factor in all of these different empires, that it's the hand of God that would move them on the scene and then off the scene as we go through the story of both Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 7. So we'd like to kind of look then at this, this creature, um, this four-headed leopard, and the birth of the Grecian Empire. Because when this Grecian Empire came along, what we see is basically that it was an empire that sprung out of the northwestern part of what was the, the Mediterranean area. Um, up to this point, it was the, the empire of the Medes and the Persians. And it would be out of the Medo-Persian Empire that the Greeks would come. They were ruled over by the Medes and the Persians at uh, different points in time. Um, they were under tribute. They were a tributary nation at this point in time, at the beginning of the empire, which means that, you know, like all good rebel rebellions, it started with a tax revolt. Um, you can think of how sort of America got its independence. Um, it was a tax revolt. Those people around the Boston Harbor, they went and took and they tossed all the tea into the harbor, you know, and that's when the whole sort of American Revolution kicked in and they revolted and they broke away on their own. Well, we understand that, that makes total sense, but it was the same back um, in the year 300 to 400 BC. There was a ruler at the time, and um, he lived in this area of Macedonia, um, which is, you know, we, we hear about it today, Macedonia in Greece, um, just off the coast of Turkey there, um, across from Italy, and uh, just below all the troubled areas of, of the, um, you know, Yugoslavia and that broke up into Serbia and Croatia. And in this area was a ruler by the name of Philip. And this is a, uh, a picture or a statue of him. This is from his tomb, Philip of Macedon. And um, this is actually one of the, the remnants of a palace that he built. It's called the Philippian. And um, it was a place that he built uh, to honor his kingdom. And what he had done was he had united under himself the different separate tribes um, that made up the area of Greece, Macedonia, um, Thrace, and so on. And he pulled all these, these countries together so that by the year 336, when he died, um, it was somewhat of a, of a united kingdom. Um, and I say somewhat because, of course, the Greeks are the inventors of democracy. And um, it's very difficult to rule over people who want a rule of the people. Um, so what ends up happening is, of course, there's revolts throughout the history of, of the Greeks. Um, but that's what Philip did. He pulled this empire together. Um, and he married a, a woman named Olympias. Um, this wasn't a very good marriage. Um, she was the daughter of Epirus, a tribal king. Um, and uh, unfortunately things didn't go so well for her at first. She was the mother of a man called Alexander the Great, who was born in 356 BC. Um, but the problem was that Philip went on to marry another woman. 
And um, her name is Cleopatra. She was uh, Greek, not the Cleopatra we all know, but um, that's a Greek name. Um, and Olympias was sent into exile with her son, Alexander. And uh, it's believed that she ordered the assassination of Philip down the road in around 336 BC because she feared that when Cleopatra had a son, which she did, that he would become the legitimate heir to the Greek throne and not her boy, Alexander. So um, she had Philip killed and later on had Cleopatra killed and her son killed. And uh, she was kind of a, not the nicest person in the world. But anyway, that was sort of the beginning of it. And this here in the background is the tomb of Philip, which is still there today. So archaeologists have dug it up, and uh, this is what it sort of looks like, a cutaway of what's on the inside. And there's all kinds of different treasures in there um, that basically give testament to his reign. Well, Alexander comes onto the scene really um, early on. Uh, he was a young man, and we've probably heard about Aristotle. Well, Aristotle was his teacher. Um, so Philip, being a king, picked a, a very famous um, and infamous uh, philosopher of the day and had Aristotle teach Alexander. A lot of people believe that that was part of what made Alexander so successful. But at the age of 13, um, Alexander was a fairly wild young man. And there's a story of Alexander and his horse. And uh, what had happened was Philip, being the king at the time, had been given a horse as a present. And it was a massive black Thessalian stallion. And um, it was a sum of 13 talents that would be um, given to whoever could tame this horse because it was just unruly. And so what happened was Alexander promised, he says to his dad, he said, well, you know, dad, I will pay for this horse if I can't tame it. So his dad thought this was a bit of a joke and um, said, sure, go ahead, give it a shot, cocky young 13-year-old. What Alexander had realized is that the horse kept on seeing its shadow, and as soon as it saw its shadow, it would spook and it would run. So he turned it away from its shadow into the sun so it couldn't see its shadow, and then it calmed right down, and he hopped on the horse and spoke so so or soothingly to it and uh, turned it towards the sun, and off he rode. And that, of course, is the beginning of, of sort of everybody's respect for Alexander. And it was his war horse for many years, till around 326 BC, um, till he reached the modern um, a city in what is today modern Pakistan. So that's sort of the beginnings of this Grecian Empire. Macedon had been expanded to cover the area of Greece and Thrace. Uh, Philip dies, and Alexander the Great comes onto the scene. He's not that great yet, because all he's done is ride a horse, but he would become a very, very infamous person. But I want you to just turn in your Bibles over to Daniel chapter 8, because so far we just had a couple of almost static um, stories of, or prophecies that one identifies an empire, the Greeks. The second one identifies um, in Daniel chapter 7, um, more of an animated creature, this, this goat with the, or not goat, sorry, the, the leopard with the, uh, the four heads and the four wings. Daniel chapter 8, though, gives us the story of the succession of the two empires, one against the other. And it, it's given to us in Daniel chapter 8, and it, it's quite the prophecy um, because it plays out exactly as it is written. And it's the vision of two other interesting creatures. There's a ram, and there is a goat. And when you're looking at this, you say, okay, well... There's a whole barnyard of animals that keep on popping up in this scene. And Daniel, how are we supposed to figure out what all of this means? But the, the best thing about Daniel chapter 8 is it names who these people are for us. It, it really gives us the indications of what we're dealing with. So Daniel, to start this off, he's at the summer palace of the Persian kings in a place called Susa or Shushan, the palace. It's the same palace that comes up later on with Esther. Remember, Queen Esther was in Shushan, the palace, and Mordecai was there. It was the summer palace of the Persian kings. And it's here that Daniel has a dream. It's during the third year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, 11 years before Babylon's demise. And of course, at this point in time, um, Shushan and Persia is under the hand of the Babylonians. They're, they rule over it. And he reads this, or hears this story, or sees the story of a ram and a goat. And so he, he looks up, he says, and uh, he's on this river called Ulei, 
and it's in the area of Medo-Persia. He says, I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram that had two horns. Now, that's nothing spectacular. Um, there was a ram that had two horns. But the interesting thing is that this ram, we're told what it represents. And that comes down in verse 20. So if you look down to verse 20, the ram which you saw, he says, having two horns, are the kings of the Medes and the Persians. And those were the ones that were coming next. So the Medes and the Persians would follow on. And of course, um, archaeology attests to this. This isn't just fairy tales. Uh, this is the tombs of the Persian kings. Darius the first, the second, Artaxerxes and Xerxes the first that are there in Persia today. And on these tombs, um, there are some, some carvings that tell us all about this. Their tombs are in a place called Persopolis, which would become the capital city of the, the Persians. And of course, they'd been a rather busy bunch. In fact, Darius the first um, had tried to invade the Greeks and failed to do so um, at the Battle of Marathon in the year 490 BC. Now, you've probably all heard about people running a marathon. Well, where it comes from is one of the messengers, a man named, uh, uh, I'm going to try and pronounce this, Pheidippides, um, who was a Greek runner who ran to Athens with the victory, um, the news of the victory, and it basically inspired the whole story um, of this, this uh, marathon. Because what he did was he ran these 26 miles, delivered his message, and then dropped dead on the spot. So to honor him, they would run this run every year. Um, personally, I question the wisdom in you know, repeating something that caused somebody to drop dead. But anyway, um, that's what they do every year. And uh, we have marathons all over the place. But that's where it comes from, the Battle of Marathon. So this was the Persians who had invaded the Greeks, and the Greeks had won many, many years ago. So this Medo-Persian ram had done a little agitating. And it was largely under this king Xerxes, the son of Darius the Great. So on these tombs, um, there is Xerxes, who is standing behind his father, Darius the Great. And of course, the king is always depicted as the, the tallest one. And here Xerxes is behind him. And we read in this uh, Daniel chapter 8, verse 4, four he says, I saw the ram... So this is the Medo-Persians, and he's pushing westward, northward, and southward. So if he's pushing towards the west, and towards the north, and towards the south, it means he must be coming from the east. So the Medo-Persians came from the east, and they pushed north, south, east, and west, and, um, or northwest and, and south, and there was nothing that could stand before them. Neither could any deliver out of their hand, but he did according to his will and became great. So Xerxes, the son of Darius, pushed, in fact, right into Greece, and uh, he invaded Greece in the year 483, and um, when he was there, you can see this, this medallion here that has a Greek soldier fighting a Persian soldier, and um, they lost, um, so he got a little ticked off with the whole thing, and he decided to burn to the ground um, the whole uh, city of Athens, and he torched the whole thing and went off in somewhat of a huff. In fact, it was a, a massive battle that took place, um, one of the biggest naval battles that the world had ever seen. There was 517,000 soldiers and sailors um, in ships that went out with 3,000 galleys, 1,207 um, of their, their fancy Greek ships, uh, 1,700,000 troops from 47 different nations, 80,000 cavalry. The Persian forces were around 2,317,000. And the Greeks had about 324,000. Um, so they're outnumbered many times to one. But the Persians actually lost the whole war. And so um, Xerxes went home a little cheesed off. And um, it would be his son... Um, Darius III, or, or a descendant, I should say, the last of the, the emperors of the Persians, sitting on his throne, uh, depicted here, but he was somebody who was now standing still. In verse 3 of Daniel 8, if you still got to open this, he lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two forms. Because he's now standing still. Their period of conquest was over, and he stands still, and bursting onto this vision is another character. 
So he says, as I was considering, behold, he says, an he goat came from the west on the face of the whole ground, and it had a notable horn and uh, between his eyes, and we're told who that notable horn is. It's given to us in verse 20. The rough goat is the king of the Greeks, and the great horn is, or the great horn is between his eyes, is the first king. So what he's telling us is in this picture, you've got the Medo-Persians depicted by a ram. The Greeks, the rough or the hairy goat is what it means, is depicted by this, this goat. And it has a one notable horn on its head. And uh, that horn is the first king. Um, and the first king of that united empire, of course, was Alexander the Great. And we read there that the ram had come to the, or the goat came to the ram and ran unto him in the fury of his power, and he smites the ram and breaks his two horns and stamps upon him and grinds him to powder, basically. So he destroys this, this ram and stands in his place. And of course, this notable horn is this Alexander the Great. And the story of the Greek Empire and its, and its sort of uh, coming together is really the story of Alexander's exploits. So when we consider what happened back in the year 334 um, BC, Alexander the Great leaves the country of Greece in the city of Pella around 334, and he crosses the Hellespont, which is the little piece of sea um, between what is Europe and Asia Minor. Uh, it's a very famous place. The Bosphorus area is all in there. And um, the first major battle he has is a place called Granicus. And it's at Granicus that he meets the forces of the satraps, or the rulers, the governors of Asia Minor, who are under the Persians. And their army, in fact, included many Greek mercenaries. So soldiers for hire. Alexander crossed the river and caught them off guard and absolutely crushed them. And he led the uh, horse companions in this battle, charging himself out front and smashed the center line of them. And so um, it was quite a, uh, 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 an attack that took place, and they lost miserably, and um, so the Persians were somewhat on the run. So Alexander continued on here through Sardis and Ephesus, down to uh, the next place, as he passed through Ephesus, he came down to a place called Halkamassos. Um, and it's there that Alexander basically engaged the land fortresses, uh, land forces at a fortress of a place called Alinda. Um, but the queen, being a, a fairly austere per, or a smart person, um, surrendered to Alexander. And um, Alexander kind of repaid the favor and said, all right, since you've surrendered to me, um, you can still be queen. And uh, this became a pattern that he would follow. Those who surrendered to him, he would bring them into his entourage. In fact, he did this with just about every battle that he fought. Um, unlike people later on like Tamerlane or, or Genghis Khan, who when they fought, they would just kill everybody and pile their heads up in, in skull piles. Um, what Alexander would do is he'd get to the point where the battle was pretty well won, and then he would give the, the enemy on the other side an option. We can either kill you all, or you can join us. And of course, most people went, let me think about that, and uh, decided to join them. So Alexander's armies grew quite large. So he passed through this whole area, and on his way, he came to this place called Gordia, where there was this Gordian knot. You may have heard the story of the Gordian knot and how Alexander the Great came there, and there was this great oracle, and there's this knot tied to this chariot that was tied in such a way that nobody could figure out how to undo the knot. And the prophecy was that whoever undid the knot would be the ruler of the whole area. So Alexander said, well, that's pretty easy. Whipped out his sword and chopped the knot in two and therefore undid the knot and went on to rule Asia. So uh, from here, they went on to, um, through Gordia, um, down to a place called Issus, which is where probably the most definitive battle of this whole place took, or this whole campaign took place. Um, this was against Darius, the last king of the Persians. And his forces numbered around 600,000 soldiers. Just to give you an idea of how many people that is, um, the entire uh, Persian Gulf War, the first Persian Gulf War in 1991, um, the entire Allied force was 500,000. 
Okay, this is 600,000 on just one side of the battle. And this battle took place in a five mile stretch. We're not talking all of Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and Iraq. We're talking about five pitched miles, uh, 600,000 men. So Alexander the Great came charging into this area and his army was all of 40,000. He would picked up a few after traveling through. And this is a depiction of the battle. You can see Alexander on the left hand side there and Darius um, with the funny looking turban thing on the right hand side in his war chariot. And uh, this, this is actually a, a mosaic from Pompeii. And when they unearthed Pompeii, this is on the walls of one of the, the palaces in Pompeii. And um, Alexander the Great, of course, is there depicted in great detail. And um, he came rushing into this battle, and like most of them, he joined in himself. And the battle was engaged against Darius, the king of the Persians. Darius has actually brought his entire family along. It was kind of like, you know, uh, the early days of the Civil War, where they all brought deck chairs, and they sat up on the hills to watch this little battle take place and watch the Greeks get trounced. Um, except they didn't, and uh, everybody went running for their lives. Um, but this gives you an idea of the size of it. There's the Persian army, 600,000 men, um, Greeks, Orientals, and, of course, the, the, the bulk of the Persian forces um, with their chariots and their horsemen. And uh, Alexander, with his um, cavalry, that was the, the speed that they traveled with. And this is one of the things it says about the goat, is that it didn't touch the ground, right? It went so fast. And so um, the 40,000 on Alexander's size are dwarfed by the 600,000 Persians. So they, they put their men fairly thin, spread them out, and this Battle of Issus took place. And this is a depiction of it. Many years later was this made up. But Alexander led his companions, as he calls them, the cavalry, onto the right flank um, of the enemy. And uh, he had, of course, a little secret weapon that the Persians hadn't really run into yet. And it was called the phalanx. And the phalanx, I'll show you a picture of it in a minute, were under the command of his friend Parmenian. And um, the Persian cavalry charged the Parmenian and uh, crossed over the river into the battle. But Alexander's left wing um, swung around and uh, crushed their advance. And uh, his other friend, uh, Hepastases, I think he's called, um, helped out with this whole thing. And that's kind of what it looks like as the, uh, the Persians came across. Alexander crossed the river on the other side, broke through their ranks, and just routed them. But one of the things that they had in their use was this phalanx which is a series of spears that would be put out in a row. And um, after they had shish kebab their victims, they would pull them out and the next set of spears would come down. And it was just like a, um, a roving changeover. So if you were in the front and you had your spear, once you'd speared your man, you'd pull your spear out, you'd run to the back, you'd stand your spear back up, and then you'd come forward again. And, and basically as this machine almost went along like a combine harvester, um, they would just kill man after man after man. So it was a terrible, terrible situation for Darius. And of course, he fled from the battle. So they, they broke up this group, the mercenaries, and this great king realized that, you know, he'd lost the battle. And um, what ended up happening is he ran. And as soon as he ran, all his soldiers saw the king running, and um, they all basically uh, collapsed in this, this ancient battle. And um, it was quite the nasty battle, and the victory was very decisive, and Darius um, had to flee. So Alexander came from Issus then, and uh, Darius moved on. He went further east to Babylon and Susa and those areas. Um, but Alexander, being a, a military commander, he knew that the, the Persians ruled all the way down into Egypt. So he didn't want to leave um, his, his sort of flanks unguarded. So he decided that he would go south first, and he went down to the ancient city of Tyre. Now, Tyre was the merchant city of the day. It was the place where all the merchants of the world would bring their wares, and they would actually bring them on their ships, the Tyrian ships, the Phoenicians. And um, it was a city that was believed to be impregnable. It's really another subject, but I just want you to go in your Bibles to Ezekiel 26, because it's another prophecy against the city of Tyre that Alexander would fulfill. Now, the prophecy in Ezekiel 
is written around the year uh, 650 or so BC. Um, Alexander would come along around 330 BC. So Ezekiel is the book just a few pages before Daniel. And in chapter 26, he tells us there, this is a prophecy in verse 2 against Tyrus. And he says, uh, because that Tyrus hath said against Jerusalem, aha, she is broken, and was the gates of the people, uh, she is turned unto me, I shall be replenished, and now she shall be, uh, she is laid waste. Therefore, God says, I'm going to do this. So what he's talking about was because when Jerusalem was attacked by the Babylonians, the Tyrians in the north rejoiced over it, and Jerusalem was God's people, Israel, it was his kingdom, it's the kingdom of God, um, he says, I'm going to do this to you. So we read there, he says in verse 3, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and I will cause many nations to come against thee, as the sea causes the waves to come up. So there will be waves of attack. The first wave of attack came by the Babylonians, and the second one came by Alexander the Great. So in verse 4, they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers, and I will scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. And he says in verse 7, first of all, Nebuchadnezzar will come against you. And then later on, he talks about um, the destruction of the city as a top of the rock, verse 14, a place for the spreading of nets. Now, what has happened, this is a picture of ancient Tyre, and that's the passage from Ezekiel. Um, Nebuchadnezzar came, Tyre used to be on the coast, right on the, the land itself. And when Nebuchadnezzar came, the Tyrians moved their capital out onto this island um, in the water. And so the prophecy was that they would be destroyed, but they thought that they'd, they'd beat this prophecy. And um, Alexander came along and there was a problem. He didn't have any ships. There was this, this great empire sitting off um, the coast full of gold and silver and all the things he needed to, to pay his troops with, and he couldn't take the city because he didn't have any, so, any, any ships, or not enough of them anyway. So what he did was he decided to build a causeway. It's called a dam here on the picture, but it's from the old city of Tyre out to this new city of Tyre that sat on the water. And what he did was he literally scraped the rocks of the old city. All the walls that had been broken down by Nebuchadnezzar 300 years prior, he carried all those rocks, not him personally, but his men, and they chucked them into the sea and built this causeway across so they could attack the city of Tyre. And so here's a depiction of them coming with their siege towers, and the Tyrians were, were pretty, uh, um, how would you put it, they were, they were good defenders, for sure, and you can see the little ship there uh, that's going against them. What it had was big kettles of burning oil in it. It's a fire ship, and they sent this against his battle uh, ramps there and burned them to the ground. So it took him, I think we had six months altogether to destroy this place, but seven months the siege lasted, and people just thought he was absolutely crazy. But he said, look, if I leave this behind, everybody will say, well, he couldn't, he couldn't do it. So he went and he destroyed the city of Tyre. And finally, they breached the walls. And um, Alexander personally uh, joined in the attack on the city. And um, he was not very happy with them because um, what had happened was they had sent ambassadors. And the men of Tyre had actually murdered those ambassadors and thrown their heads over the walls. Um, so Alexander decided that he would uh, do away with the Tyrians. So um, there was 6,000 fighting men that were killed in the city, and 2,000 Tyrians were crucified on the beach. Another 30,000 people were sold into slavery. And um, that is what it looked like back at the turn of the, the last century, around the year 17, 1800. Um, and the causeway that he built had become a place for fishermen to lay out their nets, to dry them, and to repair them. Um, because it filled up with sand, and this is what it looks like today. Um, in fact, the causeway runs right down the middle, and uh, it's just there's beaches on both sides filled with silt, and the ancient city of Tyre is still out on the island, but it's, it's a much bigger place altogether now. But it was a place for the spreading of nets. And so the word of God spoken in Ezekiel 300 years in advance came true as Alexander went through this place. He continued on his exploits down from Tyre and Sidon 
to the city of Jerusalem. And uh, it was a place that was um, in great fear of Alexander because in Jerusalem, um, they had sided with the Medes and the Persians because the Medes and the Persians had actually been pretty good to the Jews and it allowed them the freedom of religion. Um, and of course, it was under Cyrus the Persian that they were sent back. Um, so they were very afraid of what Alexander would do. And he had gone there with the intent of destroying the city. And the, what the high priest did was he, and it's recorded for us in a book called Josephus, The History of the Jews. And uh, he lined up all the, the, the priests along the road going into the city, dressed them all in white, opened the gates of the city. And as Alexander rode up on his war horse, um, he was met by the high priest. And the priest took the book of Daniel. This is a depiction of Rembrandt time, so it probably looked nothing like this, but you get the idea. They took the prophecy of Daniel and they showed Alexander the Great the prophecy of Daniel 2, the prophecy of Daniel 7, and of Daniel 8, and said, See, God has said that you are going to be victorious. And it was because of this that Alexander spared Jerusalem and the Jews, and um, they were in his favor from that point on. So he went on from here down into Egypt, and uh, actually Gaza, first of all. Gaza's always been a place of, of uh, conflict. There was a great big battle that took place in Gaza. And he went down into Egypt and founded a place called Alexandria before going on to an oracle somewhere out in the desert. And, of course, Alexandria um, is a very famous place. This is the lighthouse in Alexandria. There was one of the seven wonders of the world built out in the harbor. And um, the other thing that was built there was the Great Library of Alexandria, which was the place that had the most volumes of books in the ancient world. And it's, in fact, one of Alexander's uh, successors, a man named Ptolemy II, who built this massive library um, that would become a center of learning. And he commissioned the Hebrew Torah, or the Bible, to be translated into Greek by 72 Jewish scholars. And it became known as the Septuagint, uh, version of the Bible, um, which we have available for us today. And that was used largely in the Greek world during the time of the apostles. So when you look at this, as he came through um, this area of Alexandria, he then went back out into the desert areas to the Ammon Oracle, which of course told him that he was a great ruler and would do great things, and that's exactly what he wanted to hear. Um, he went back up through Memphis, not the Memphis in Tennessee, but the real Memphis in, in Egypt. And um, went all the way up to Damascus following the same route that actually Abraham would have taken um, many years earlier until he got to a place called Gagamela um, where he fought another massive battle with the Persians. This time their army was somewhat reduced. It was about 200 to 300,000, but it was the final decisive battle and it was um, a very gory event as well. And uh, the, the Persian king at this point in time was completely trounced and was now just on a dead run um, to try and escape from Alexander and his forces. He had been routed, and he was a, a wanted man now, and he was on the run. This is a, a depiction from one of the, uh, I think it's a sarcophagus that this thing comes from. Um, but he would go on from there, and Alexander went down to Babylon, which um, he brought under his empire, and it wasn't really a, a good place for him to be. He spent most of his time there partying and uh, drinking, and uh, they, in fact, they spent several months in Babylon having a good old time until finally they went on to subdue the rest of the Persian Empire. They went to Susa, or Shushan the palace as it was known, and then on to Persopolis, which was the capital city of the Persians. And um, it's here that Alexander had another um, great party and um, a celebration, and some of the people that were with him suggested that since it was Xerxes who came from this area that had burned Athens to the ground, they should return the favor and burn Persopolis to the ground, which is exactly what they did. And um, in fact, it was in a drunken sort of uh, feast that this happened, and it was for the 200 year earlier um, sort of spite you for what you did to us, Alexander almost regretted it immediately because he realized this was now his palace, um, but it was kind of too late and the whole thing burnt to the ground. And um, the ruins of Persopolis are there today. And uh, in fact, some of it is in the Chicago Institute in 
um, Chicago, the Middle Eastern Institute. You can go and see it today. So Alexander went on from here on his conquest, um, just like it says that the goat would rush from the east, or from the west, sorry, and it would, it would crush this thing to the ground. And he took over the rest of this entire empire. He went up to Ecbatana, which had been the capital of the Medes. The Persians had had their capital in Persopolis. And um, from here, he traveled way out into the east, um, as far as uh, India, really. He went as far up north as the beginnings of Afghanistan and um, all the way down south um, through c some places we know today, Kabul, the Khyber Pass, um, and uh, Bucephalia, which is where his horse is buried, that's up here, and um, right the way down across the, the Ganges or along that area. Um, didn't quite get into India as far as he wanted to, um, but you'll notice there that he sort of was a bit of a megalomaniac and liked to name cities after himself. So there's some 30-some cities that are called Alexandria um, in all these different places he went. However, his men got tired, and they said, enough of this. We want to go home. We want to see our wives and our children that we don't even know. We've been gone for a decade. And um, so they kind of somewhat revolted against him, and he was forced to give up his conquest once he reached the, the shores of India and had to return, so he did, and they came all the way back and um, made it as far as Babylon. It was in Babylon, though, where, you know, people did what they did in Babylon. They had a great big drunken feast, and it's believed that Alexander drank from what's called the Hercules Cup, which held four bottles of wine, and he downed the whole thing, and funnily enough, was struck with severe abdominal pain, and uh, a few days later, he died on June the 11th, 323. He'd begun his whole conquest at just 20 some years of age and died at 32, 33 years old. And it's just interesting that Proverbs 31 verse 4, you don't have to turn it up, but what it says is, it is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine nor for princes strong drink. And this was a lesson um, that Alexander didn't learn, he just experienced it. Um, that he died, and that was the end of Alexander the Great. In fact, it's interesting because in Babylon, very recently, they found this tiny little uh, cube, um, which has the cuneiform writing on it, and uh, it's a little clay tablet, and that clay tablet records Alexander's death. And um, a great funeral procession took place. The emperor would be taken back to Macedonia, and uh, that's uh, a depiction of his courtars, all the different horses, so hundreds of horses would, would drag this thing along. And um, the idea was to bring it to Macedonia, but it didn't get there because Ptolemy, one of his generals um, who would succeed him, um, decided that he would steal it, the, the corpse that is, and take it to Memphis, which he did. And later it was transferred to a sarcophagus in Alexandria, and the sarcophagus would have looked somewhat like this. It was a gold sarcophagus filled with honey um, that was basically turned, uh, used to basically preserve the body. Um, this isn't his. It would have looked like this because his was taken by a later ruler, one of the Ptolemies, who was uh, out of money and decided to melt it down and turn it into coins. Um, so that was the end of Alexander's tomb. Um, but that's pretty much what happened to Alexander, but that was not the end of the Greek Empire, because we read in um, Daniel chapter 8 that the great horn would be broken. So Daniel chapter 8, verse 8, we've kind of followed the history of Alexander's exploits, but we read here, he says, therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And in its place, or for it, came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. So this is the story of this, this great goat. He had this notable horn, Alexander the Great, which was the first king. But at the height of his power, when he's only 30-something years old, he dies. And in his place, there comes up four others. Um, and we're told what that means in verse 22. Now... That being broken, the great horn, four stood up in its place. Four kingdoms shall stand out, up out of the nation, but not in his power. 
And in fact, Daniel 11 tells us a little bit more in verse 4. It says that when he shall stand up, his kingdom will be broken. It will be divided toward the four winds of heaven, the four corners of the earth, that is, not to his posterity or not according to his uh, children, but according to his dominion, which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for four others beside it. So Alexander's empire, as he was dying on his deathbed, they asked him who was to succeed him. And he did have a son at this point in time. And he didn't say it's going to be my son. He said it's whoever is the strongest, which of course plunged the whole empire into a civil war that took some 50 years to fight out. And the four successors eventually would be men that served with him or men that served under men that were with him. There was Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. And the empire was divided into four. Cassander took the north. He was the Macedonian emperor. And um, he made sure that he would be king um, because Alexander did have a son. And so what he did was murder Alexander's son, and his widow, a woman named Roxana, and uh, assassinated them both in 310 BC to make sure that he would be the only legitimate successor to the throne. Next to him was Lysimachus. He ruled over the Thracian Empire, and it would slowly disappear over history. It was eventually overtaken by the Romans, but that's Lysimachus there. And um, that's the area of Thrace in the north, which is um, Alexander's father, Philip of Macedon, had included into their empire. And what we know today as Turkey, or Asia Minor as it was called. And then there was the other man, Seleucus, who probably had the biggest swath of land. He ruled over from Thrace, right the way across the east into Afghanistan, into India, and south as far as the Gaza Strip. The area in the middle between Damascus and Gaza was always under dispute between the two empires um, because the other one was Ptolemy who reigned in the south and of course it's that area in the middle that would be the contested area. So that is the story of the Greek empire in Bible prophecy. It's all laid out in Daniel chapter 8 in great detail. How that this king would come along, he would move super fast from the west, way into the east, and towards the south, and he would destroy the Greek or the, the Medo-Persian Empire, he'd trample it underfoot, and he would be at the height of his power, and he would die, and then in his place would come four other empires, his four generals, not one of his sons, um, but that they would establish themselves there. And eventually, this story is picked up in Daniel 11, and it becomes the story of the king of the north and the king of the south. But it's just very interesting that when you look at all of this and you go back to Daniel 2, the first of these visions, we had the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, and the Greeks. There's another empire that follows them, which is the Romans, and finally Europe of today, which is the the feet of the, the iron and the clay. And you look at that and you say, well, that's world history rolled out and told to us. But it's actually more than world history, because just go back to Daniel chapter 2 and take a look at what it says. Because it's actually telling us this is the kingdom of men that would exist from Nebuchadnezzar's time all the way up until the kingdom of God would be established. In verse 28, we read there, there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. So this picture, although it traverses history, and right from Babylon in 600 BC through to Rome and onto Europe today, the picture is really...